Washington. Unfortunately, he uh, woke up this morning and didn't feel so well. So uh, y'all are stuck with me again. If I'd have had some suspenders, I would have worn them. But I don't have any. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining afar through shadows dim, giving a light for those who long have gone, and guiding the wise men on their way unto the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star. Good morning, church. Welcome, 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 visitors. Um, well, uh, I wanted to just remind everybody. You know, there, there's the standard protocol of if you're visiting, you can fill out the the card in front of you, or go to the bulletin here, and there's the QR code, and you can take a photo there and put your information in there. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm the youth minister, um, so uh, I do a lot of stuff with the kids um, during class. Then we do Bible hour. And it was kind of fitting today. We were talking about being a witness and um, to, to others uh, within the church and outside the church. But um, it brought me to uh, Ephesians chapter six, verse nineteen through twenty. You know, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me. So, let me repeat that. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fiercely know the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, pray that I may declare it fiercely as I should. And so we had a long, long class on that today about what does that mean about being bold and being a witness to others. And uh, so I encourage them to do that in class, to speak up, to ask questions, and to really think of the scripture and how can I make this part of my life in class, on the football field, or in team sports, or in band, and so I and definitely encourage that. And so I've seen a lot of progression there. I just want to give you all, it's, it's been very uplifting. Um, last Wednesday, we had enough kids to where I was able to get the bus and drive around and pick kids up at their, at their house. So that was good. Yeah, thank you. And so uh, it's, it's high energy. I enjoy it. Uh, they had a fun time on the bus and it was a good experience. So we're doing a lot of good things. And I know they're a good example to others in the classroom. So I, I definitely love that. So let's go in prayer. Uh, Lord, thank you for this wonderful day, a chance for us to come together and focus on your word and uh, read your scripture and, and take it and let it be written on our hearts that we will be bold and fearless in speaking to others um, and uh, teach others and be nurturing and use that Holy Spirit that you give us, Lord. Um, just let us go forth and have a good day and a good worship in Jesus name. Amen. No glorious abode, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor, and girded with praise. Thy bountiful Breeze in the air, it shines. 
God, our righteous and holy Heavenly Father, we come before Thee with humble hearts, thanking You for all the many blessings You send our way. Thankful for the medical facilities in this community, the many members of our congregation who need their services. James Haney, Colleen Carroll, thankful for James Cheevers and Connie Cryer who had successful cataract surgery. <clears throat> Larry Doak had surgery and is doing well. Sally Gray learned to had a pinched nerve in her spine and will have a new MRI. Be with Kelly McLeod and Trish in their dealings with medical problems. Be with all the others of this congregation, Heavenly Father, who are in need of medical help. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with the elders of this congregation that they oversee the work in this location and elsewhere be with the deacons heavenly father as they perform duties of this congregation go with us now through this service guide guard and direct us is our prayer in christ's name amen All right, this is definitely Bob's song. I have never led this song before. I think I can get us started, and then we'll just soldier through it together. <coughs> I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus was. Oh! 
As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, I want to reflect on the representation of the flesh shed by Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. The unleavened bread here uh, represents Jesus' flesh because Jesus knew our flesh was weak. As was said in Romans 7.18, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is, it is my sinful nature. This representation of Jesus' perfect, sinless flesh can be consumed by us to redeem us from our sinfulness with the perfect, perfectionless, perfectness of Jesus. I can't say that. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your enduring love. Thank you for your willingness of Jesus to be sacrificed so that we could be redeemed. Bless this bread and let it be the flesh of Jesus, bringing us closer to you. And Lord, shield us from sin and temptation as we go through this week. It's through Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.
as we continue, I want to look closer <clears throat> at the blood represented by the juice in the small cups. Blood in the Bible often is associated with atonement and the forgiveness of sins. It's also the basis for covenants, as we see in the covenant between God and Abraham. It's also, though, associated with life and vitality. In Leviticus 17.11, it stated, <clears throat> For the life of a creature is in its blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Clearly, we're told that life is in the blood. So, when we take this juice today, let it be the blood of Jesus. Let it bless you with the life of Jesus. Not just the perfection, but the passion, the vigor, the vitality to strengthen God's kingdom. Let us pray. Dear God, let this juice you give us now be the blood of Jesus. Let it flow through us to strengthen us and give us the passion for your kingdom. Let us use this vitality this week to grow your kingdom through our words, our actions, and let us make your kingdom better each day. It's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We take this time now to look at how we can give back. In his inaugural address, President John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Similarly, let's take time now to think about what you can do for God's church. It doesn't have to be only monetary. Many offer their time and service each week to expand the church in our community. Look at how you can give back to the church and how your efforts, whether through action, through service, or through your donations, can grow God's kingdom. Let us pray. God, you've brought together an amazing group of people here, each with their own gifts given by you. I ask that you guide each of their hearts to you and soften their hearts and focus their minds so they can see how to use your gifts to make this church, this community, and this country a better. Shape us into stewards that reflect you in each of our actions. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Today I'll be reading Mark 4, verses 9 through 12. Then Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding understanding otherwise they might turn and be forgiven all right those who are ages three years to third grade please meet alan back here at our back door and he'll take them over there for their bible hour Let's the rest of us please stand as we sing this song together. <clears throat> joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory. Yeah. 
Good morning. Welcome each and every one of you this morning, especially those who are visiting, those who may be joining us through the means of electronic medium. Uh, however you're joining us this morning, we are appreciative of you being here and hope we can find a blessing together and being in God's presence. And especially if you're visiting, we hope we you let us reach out to you and greet you and and welcome you back. And, and if you're looking for a church home, we hope that you uh, explore us carefully and ask ask questions and anything that you need to know please uh, ask one of us here and and um, we'll uh, we'll strive to answer that for you we we uh, we strive to be a, a church home where people like to come and plug in and be involved in in uh, what God's people are doing in this particular place so uh, we thank you for being with us a uh, couple things before uh, we get into the text this morning first the sports report uh, all, all I'm going to say about that is that there's a reason I'm wearing a tie that has burnt orange in it this morning. I don't have a burnt orange shirt, but I have a tie. Al, Alvin said, uh, Alvin told me last night, he said, uh, you ought to wear orange this morning. Uh, and, uh, well, I, I did it, Alvin. I wore my orange tie. So, um, the only other thing I'll say is hook them horns. And you, if you're, if you know, you know. Okay, if you know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so um, the other thing I need to say before we get into the text is uh, kind of a, a want to thank you for those who have already returned uh, the Cherokee gifts, and a number more have, have come in today. But an impassioned request is please get those in by this Wednesday. This Wednesday is the deadline, and the reason we have people put their numbers on there phone numbers is so I can reach out to you and if there's or you can reach out to me if there's some way that we have to arrange something um, if they can't get in by Wednesday but I just say please make sure that they're in by Wednesday now I know some I'm saying that to aren't here maybe uh, that that to whom that applies but anyway we hope you can meet that uh, meet that deadline and thanks for all those that are already already back back here. Turn, if you would, to uh, Mark chapter 8 in your Bibles, and we're going to start in uh, uh, verse uh, 22 today. Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 22. Uh, this part will not be on the screen. Um, we'll have some references uh, up there eventually. Uh, I found some of the very interesting I thought I'd share with you uh, today. This is particular of interest will be to my wife, probably. Uh, this is a Bible I've used for many, many years, and oftentimes um, I will put a notation of a, of a particular passage, I'll write above it or in the margin the date that I preached that passage or spoke about it or taught about it or whatever. Well, I, I was very interested to note this morning, I haven't used this Bible in quite a while, so... I open it this morning, preparing to use it today, and I find the notation on our text for this morning, 12, 3, 93. 93. 30 years ago, uh, I was not even regularly week to week in a pulpit uh, at this date 30 years ago. I was living in Searcy because a certain redhead was living in Searcy, finishing up school at Harding, and... Um, so I don't know where that, what I did that day, but it did something regarding this passage. So I thought that was interesting that 30 years to the day, uh, we're talking about it this morning. So there you go. little walk down memory lane. Uh, doesn't mean anything to y'all, but it's interesting to me. Um, they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he'd spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't go into the village. 
this morning I'm likening this to a New Testament version of the burning bush encounter which Moses had with God in the desert. You see how this is kind of a kind of a modern updated burning bush story with Jesus uh, with Moses rather than the original incident. It was a very strange sight. Nothing here anyone had ever seen before. This bush that was burning but it wasn't consumed. You could tell it was on fire but it wasn't it wasn't going away. It wasn't burning up. Moses said, "This is a strange sight." I'm kind of paraphrasing here. I've got to move in closer and get a better look at this. Well, it's the same with the disciples here or whoever were actually privileged to watch this play out because you notice this was a semi-private event. But Jesus, guys, quickly understood, hey, this is one for the books, guys. Jesus doesn't seem to be able to heal this blind guy on the first try. We need to move in and a little bit closer and see what's going on here. What, 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 what is this all about? You see, it was a Moses-esque moment that day at Bethsaida. At least that's the way I see it. Well, indeed, Jesus intentionally made this healing something that would require a second look and longer evaluation to catch what's going on here. So he knew exactly how to draw people in. Jesus was good at that. And Peter, who you remember if you've been in the Mark class we're in on Sunday mornings in, here in the auditorium, Peter, who gave his eyewitness account of the gospel to Mark, had Mark sort of be his secretary or his scribe, if you will. He wanted Mark to preserve this account, not only so that saints in the upcoming earlier generations of a church would get it, but so we modern age ones would get it as well. And of course, all this is under the oversight of the Holy Spirit, certainly in his guidance, to make sure that his agents presented exactly what God wanted us to have here in this text. So as we dive a, a bit deeper into this healing narrative, I urge you to put your thinking hats on here and reason, reason with me for a moment. Do you really think, do you really think that the king of the universe, co-creator with God, his father, the one who stills the stormy seas with just a word, who exercises demons with a simple command, who could heal people from a distance if he wanted to, and he did so, who raised the dead with just a word. Do you think that man, God incarnate, God in the flesh, do you think that he really needed a second touch to heal what was thought to be a very common form of blindness as this man had? No, I didn't think you did. And in fact, in fact, neither does the predominant amount of biblical scholarship through all the ages that has examined this and all the many intervening years between then and today. The point is simple. Jesus did not have to need a, a second attempt to get the man to see clearly again. He intentionally factored in a second attempt at healing. Now, the question has been made that makes people look twice at this. Why? Why did he do that? Toward what end? What purpose did this serve? So I'll try and just briefly take you through uh, scholarship, what scholarship has thought for ages about this, and then we'll close with why we have in this story good news for you and for me. I really believe Peter and Mark made the best use here of what Jesus does, which we really don't see anywhere else, this two-stage healing. But of course, there were three stages total, right? There was blindness, first of all. And uh, when we first see this man and have them urge Jesus to help him, secondly, there was partial sight. I see people, they're like trees walking around, verse 24 to finally full sight in which the man saw everything clearly. So, I said they made use of this account in which Jesus intentionally uses secondary measures to heal this man's blindness. The question is, how did they make use of it? What was Jesus doing? Many believe that Jesus was not just performing another miracle here. 
he was creating an enacted parable for us of what was going on with his disciples. Now, to see this, let's note where this healing narrative is placed. And I, I would urge you to keep your Bibles open at Mark 8, if you, if you had them open earlier. In verses just prior to this healing account, this is Mark 8, 14 through 21, as Jesus is traveling with the disciples across the lake in the boat, what are they talking about? He's telling them to watch out for the poisoning, pervasive influence, the yeast, he uses the word, of the, of the Pharisees, those folks who had just prior to that in verses 11 and 12 had come and demanded a sign from Jesus so that they might believe in him. You know, kind of a, kind of a what gives you the authority to do this? Give us a sign so we'll know, so that, so that we will have cause to believe. What's the subtext there? The subtext is they were never going to believe in him because they'd already had their mind made up. They were hard and fast determined to not believe in Jesus because he had already shown them plenty of signs that he was the Messiah. And so Jesus answers them that you know, no other sign is going to be given. You've had enough. And so Jesus brings that up to his men, the word yeast, and while they connect yeast to bread, which makes sense, that's what we would do, right? That's where we most often think of the use of, the use of yeast. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about physical bread there. He's saying that you guys are going to become hardened into disbelief by such responses like those of the Pharisees if you're not careful, if you're not cautious, if you're not paying attention. But they said, well, is this because we have no bread with us? What did they miss? They missed that Jesus was the bread of life who had provided miraculous in the wilderness just short, shortly before this time not once, but twice, two different times. One with the 5,000 plus in a Jewish setting, and then with the 4,000 in a Gentile, in a pagan setting. They should have caught it at least once. But apparently they did not. Guess what Jesus accuses them of? He says this. This is verses 17 and 18 of the text. Aware of their discussion, their rumblings about physical bread, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? You see the point of the timing then? Mark's timing with the blind man of Bethsaida story? Here we see Jesus' disciples are in stage one, where the man was when Jesus meets him, blind. They're clueless. They do not get it at this point. He had no sight. The man had no sight or insight or perception, and it seems like neither did the disciples. But now watch this. Immediately after the story of the blind man being healed in Bethesda, Bethsaida, Jesus is seen at Caesarea Philippi, and he's asking the disciples who people are saying he is. And then he asks, after he's kind of surveyed, what, what are others saying? Then he says, here's the kicker, but who do you say that I am? And this is when Peter answers, I think, representative of the whole group, he says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the King. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of things packaged in that, in that word, you are the Christ, that were meaningful to them. Now that's Mark 8.29, and as, I, as I've been saying to the class, and, and sometimes in here, that is the hinge point of the Gospel of Mark. That's where everything turns from the first part, the first part of Mark asking the question, who is this Jesus? Now we hear he's the king. We hear his own disciples admit it, confess it. Now we're going to turn, and what does that mean? You know, what kind of king? Not the kind that, he's not come to be the kind of king they think he is, that they expect, 
But we're going to have fleshed out in part two of Mark what, what does that mean? What kind of king has he come to be? Everything turns on this one statement. And we have evidence that what is happening? What's happening here by them saying this? The disciples are starting to see a little bit. It's kind of like stage two of the narrative of the blind man. But here's a problem. It's not yet clear vision, is it? They have cataracts. That comes to my mind because this church has so many cataracts. You know, I really do think the ailment is catching. I think it's, I think it's infectious because there are so many cataract surgeries going on in this church. It's, uh, it's uh, insane. Um, so they see, but they can't see clearly. Uh, there's, there's something of sight, but it's not yet depth of insight that they have. How do I know? Well, because the next Jesus gives the next thing Jesus gives his first prediction of him sacrificially laying down his life at Jerusalem for the sake of the sins of the world. This is verses 31 and 32 if you have your text open there in Mark chapter 8. A lot of stuff here happens, a lot of important stuff here happens in Mark chapter 8. And Peter says, again, I think, on behalf of the group, no, Lord, this can never be. Now, that's the, that's the account of one of the other gospel writers. In Mark, Mark just says, Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. And I thought it was very interesting, I shared this with the class this morning, that the word used Mark uses for rebuke there, that Peter does to Jesus, it's the exact same word, that Jesus would often do with demoniacs. He would rebuke them. The same word is what Peter does with Jesus. Isn't that interesting? I think it was, anyway. Uh, and so, what does Jesus answer back? Get behind me, Satan, he says. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. You're seeing just a bit... There, there's some vision there, all right? But it's not, it's not clear. It's not focused yet. It's not real clarity. You're seeing as human beings want to see things, not like spiritual beings need to see things. And so a second touch will be needed for the disciples to see clearly. And spiritually speaking, what was that second touch for the disciples? You remember... The fact that they acknowledged Jesus as Messiah was a big start. That, was, that, was, that put them on their way to vision. But they didn't get all the way to clear insight until the resurrection of Jesus. That's, that was their aha moment. When Jesus is raised from the dead, they, they get it. They say, that's it. They, and they understand what they should have seen clearly all along, that he was right in front of them. He was right there with them. But Jesus had been patient with them. He was put out at times, for sure, but he continued to, to teach them. He continued to bring them along until they finally got it. Okay, so... Why are we saying that this is such good news for you and me? Why does this story matter? Because of Jesus' disciples needed a second chance. Don't you know we desperately need it? I thought this was kind of funny. I, I googled, uh, you know, you just do a quick Google of stuff. Uh, I googled on the images, Google Images, second chances. And guess what I most often found? What, what you're seeing on the screen there. Uh, you know, animal shelters, right? They urge people to give a, a pet a second chance, right, at, at life. We, we in my family, uh, we are familiar with second chances because we have, we have two animals, we have two dogs who have had a second chance at a, at a home and family because we've, we've adopted them. Uh, we brought them into our, into our family. So, um, but don't you know we desperately need the same thing? We need second, third, fourth chances, ad infinitum. And by His grace, if we're penitent 
when we mess up and resolve to turn things around in better, fuller insight into who Jesus is and the right that he has to make claims on us to be our Lord, then whenever we inadvertently sin, we're forgiven and we move on in our Christian lives better than we were before. Let me mention the contrast that Jesus wants us, I think he wants us to see between scribes and Pharisees of the law and teachers of the law and the disciples. Contrast between those two groups and it, it makes our blessings of second chances even more clear. If you read in, in uh, Mark 8, 11 and 12, you read of a group of folks in the scribes and Pharisees who had hardened their hearts in determination to not see what was as plain as the nose on their faces, that Jesus was and is the promised one. He is the king. They had either seen or they had heard of proof after proof after proof of this with all kinds of healings, of hearing of or, or seeing perhaps dead being raised, demons being exorcised from people. Surely no further signs were necessary. They shouldn't have been. Nothing else should have been necessary. But they refused. And here's the kicker. Willful ignorance and unbelief will be left without excuse in the end when the great accounting comes. Those folks will be without excuse. They've had plenty of signs, plenty of things to look at to prove to them that Jesus is the Son of a living God, that He is Lord, that He is Christ. If they, if they let those by go by or, or, or hardened in unbelief, there's no more excuse for them. They, were like, they will be like those Jesus spoke of in Mark 4 that Michael read of from our scripture reading today, which part of what he read was a quote from Isaiah 6, verses 9 through 10, about people always seeing, never perceiving, always hearing but never understanding so they might be, so that they might turn, they might repent and be healed. Here's the difference. Here's the difference between that group and the other group. The disciples were not willfully slow. They were not proudly arrogant in their misunderstandings. They were just steeped in expectations and personal backgrounds and hopes that colored things wrongly for them at first. You know, they, they had these misconceptions or or preconceived notions that they were just part and partial growing up as a, as a Jew in Israel. They couldn't help it. Well, I can't go all the way with that, but I, I, I want to say they couldn't help it. It's who they were, okay? Their blindness was because of who they were to that point. It was not, it was not willful or malicious disbelief on their part. So when Jesus was raised from the dead, it upped their ever-increasing vision that they had to full clarity. And so the good news is today, for you and me, there is always hope. So don't lose heart. Jesus wants you to get it. And those who are striving to live within the framework of His grace they will get it. They will hear the well done, good and faithful servant. In the meantime, if you get it, it's not a rationale to get boastful or be filled with pride when you happen to encounter those who don't yet fully see. Please don't do that. Please don't say, oh, I, I understand. You're just someone who doesn't get it. That's not the way we're to treat people. We're to help them to see, right? We're to help bring them along as Jesus patiently helped his disciples along until they could see. Let's just rejoice for second touches. Can we do that? And second chances. Second choices, uh, ch uh, touches and second chances. And let's sing in our praise to God who came down and gave us that very opportunity. Let's do that 
as we stand together. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I've wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. We have several reasons, and I think, Charles, we told you this. We have several reasons for Charles to be uh, interrupted for a moment in the shepherd's time. Uh, Jerry Schmidt has a presentation to make in a moment, but uh, I guess you're still doing that this morning, right, Jerry? Uh, but he told me to go ahead with one more uh, family concern, and that is to welcome a new uh, family into our uh, church family here uh, at Salado, and so I'm, I'm going to take that opportunity now. Uh, I'm going to have them stand. We've talked to them about this. So I guess you all remember that. I'm going to have James and Monica Allen uh, to please stand there over here on my far right. Welcome. <clears throat> Welcome. We're glad to have you all with us. Uh, uh, James and Monica have come to us from the Belton congregation uh, most recently. They, uh, they work in Austin, but they live, uh, they live just, over the, just over the Long Bridge, right, in, in what we call Harker Heights. Or somewhere close over there, uh, and oh, 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 okay, all right, all right. They moved then, okay. Uh, all right. Well, thank y'all very much. Y'all can y'all can be seated. But welcome, welcome. We're glad that y'all are here, and uh, we look forward to incorporating them. They have already incorporated themselves in the work and and business of this church family. Uh, Monica's already gotten involved in meals on Wednesday nights. Uh, they they claimed uh, one of the kids, uh, one of the Cherokee kids to get a gift for. And so uh, they, they've already been starting to get into things in our church family. And so we welcome uh, more uh, of that to come. Let's pray for a moment. Father, we thank you for um, those that come seeking uh, places to plug in and, and find useful service uh, with this body of believers. And we're thankful for uh, James uh, and Monica, who come doing that today. And we pray that we can be uh, the church family that they're looking for, and we pray that uh, we can have them meaningfully get plugged in in all kinds of different ways uh, with us in the work that we have going on here. Um, and help us to be encouragement to them in every way they need as they uh, come encouraging us as well. Help us to strive, or continue to strive, always working for the good of your kingdom and doing it together uh, as we welcome more uh, souls into this fellowship and body of believers here in this place. 
Help it to make a difference in the work you have to give us, you've given us to do, kingdom work of expanding your kingdom here in this place. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. morning thank you Charles next Sunday we will have a special offering for the Zambia baby milk fund one of the missions we support the Namuyanga mission in Zambia Africa has a special wing or service it provides which is the Haven Orphanage Haven Orphanage uh, the Haven Orphanage provides care and services to the community. Unfortunately, in this area, this part of the world, one in five children are, have either lost one or both of its parents, which is about three times what it is in this country. Maternal mo uh, mortality rates is, is significantly higher also. I spoke to one of the representatives for the, uh, for the mission. I was thinking 25 orphan babies are actually being are on the uh, on formula at the at the mission, but actually she said it's more like 40 to 50. In addition to that, you have remote babies, which she said is at this point is about 40 to 60 families or babies that are being brought in from the community around also. So when you think about 100 babies, that's quite a lot of formula. <laughs> Quite a, it's a quite quite a great effort. So uh, that it helps a lot due to lack of water or lack of uh, resources. Um, it's it's something that without these babies probably wouldn't have any way to survive. So we like to get involved and help contribute to that. So next Sunday we will do that. So I ask that you keep that in your in your prayers and <laughs> and those are actually pictures of the children in the at the place. They send good pictures. So but if you have any questions, just let me know. We can talk about it. Thanks. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, Y'all know I've Patty and I and and family. I infected a a four or five, it seems, and uh, with with COVID, and uh, I was getting over it, and all of a sudden, wham, they got it, and then uh, I thought I was over it, wasn't over it, and then it's just been a long uh, a long haul, and you know, it's kind of like. Uh, I don't know why I'm thinking of this, but uh, I know stories where people had uh, uh, residents, I'm sorry, uh, visitors that stayed with them and then they wouldn't leave. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's kind of like this, this thing. Even now that I'm over it, you know, I've still got a little bit of this kind of, <clears throat> you know, and you probably heard me hacking a little bit. Uh, just. Uh, Sometimes just you can't seem to get over it, but I'm gonna do what I can. I'm not gonna talk a long time. Uh, I, I'm glad uh, the Allens, uh, Allens have been uh, attending our uh, care group uh, m several times since they first came, and so we already know them pretty well. They're great people. Uh, so glad to have you guys uh, uh, formally. So uh, I do uh, just want to finish with. Uh, uh, I like to read uh, from the Word, uh, and well, I remember it. Uh, if you guys remember Larry Robertson, he's sitting over here uh, visiting with us this morning. I told him he looks like a natural. You know, he just looks like he belongs here, and uh, so it's so good to have Larry today. Uh, I'm going to read from Psalm 146. Uh, just good positive thoughts. Uh, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord while I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not trust in nobleman, in mortal man, in whom there is no salvation. His spirit departs. He returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. But blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food for the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of those who are blind. The Lord raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over strangers. He supports the fatherless and the widow and the orphan. I'll add, but he thwarts the way of the wicked. 
The Lord will reign forever. Your God, Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, please bless our church. Please bless uh, uh, our families. Uh, we know, Father, that uh, all that uh, we have, we have to attribute to you. And uh, we just uh, covet your continued uh, 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 blessings that you, you give to us. And uh, we pray, Father, that we will be able to share those with those around us. And uh, we, we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Well, I have a couple of things also. I've been asked to remind all of you ladies that the first ladies' Advent study is tonight at 6.30, is that correct, at Nyla's house? Uh, and all of you ladies are invited to that, 6.30 at Nyla's house tonight for the ladies' Advent study. And, and then I just wanted to give as brief as I can. It's going to be difficult to be brief about it. It was so wonderful. Uh, but just a brief report on our s'mores station at our stroll uh, the last two nights, this first weekend of the stroll. Uh, I, I can't remember for sure. I've slept just a few times since then. But I think last year, the, the two-week total, the four-day total that we were out there was like twelve or 1,300 uh, s'mores packages that we distributed last year. Well, just last night and the night before, this first stroll weekend, we did just over 1,100 s'mores packages so we have pretty much equaled already what we did all of last year uh, and so uh, you know with all the s'mores donations that were contributed this past week I thought well that's definitely going to get us through this weekend and probably give us good start for next weekend we ran out last night so Travis graciously made a run to Brookshire's to, to get a few supplies that we needed and so it's it's difficult to believe, but we still could definitely use some more donations for this coming weekend. I think it's going to be even bigger because it's the last weekend of a stroll. So uh, s'mores uh, ingredients, graham crackers, marshmallows, Hershey's chocolate, bottled water, or if you'd like to contribute financially, uh, you can get a check to Bonnie or she has set up light posts. If you want to do that, if you want to do cash, we just have some forms in her office that we can fill out if you want to do that. But thank you again so much for those who have already contributed, uh, and thank you ahead of time for those of you who hopefully will. Uh, and, and as far as just volunteers being there, Travis made a great point last night. It, we really need five. Five is the ideal number of people to have at the station, we're, we're there from 5 to 9 o'clock. And so it, it's one person is the fire master. That's Gaines. He's got to take care of the fire. He's responsible for that. Now, he'll help with other things, but, but that's his responsibility. We need one person at the front table where we have the s'mores and the sticks, and we explain people how they go about getting their s'more done. Then we need a per another person, a third person, going back and forth between the table and the fire. When the people are done with their sticks, they take them, put them back in the fire, sterilize it, burn it off, put it back on the table. So that's the third person. The fourth person we need is at another table assembling more s'mores packages as we go. Or we're going to run out and there's going to be a lot of upset people. And so that's the fourth person. But he said this last night and I hadn't thought about it. We need one more. We need a fifth person to stand around the fire with people because so many of them have been wanting to visit as they're roasting their s'mores. And I even heard several people, quite a few people, asking about our church. They want to know about our church. And so if we can have that fifth person just talking with folks and visiting with them around that fire and taking that great opportunity to talk about our church with them and, and invite them to church, and, and hopefully they would come visit with us. So if anybody would like to do that this coming Friday and Saturday night from 5 to 9, let me know, and we'll definitely put you to work. There you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's all stand together, please, as we sing our closing song. <coughs> this is my daily prayer. God bless you, go with God. Hold fast His mighty hand throughout the day. His praise your heart sustain. 
Marcus Mears.